Nigel Farage Show. Mr. Nigel Farage. Thank you, Donald. Good evening, everybody. Well, I'll talk a bit about Donald Trump and his recent comments later on in the show. But meanwhile, I want to pick up on the International Trade Secretary, Liam Fox, somebody who we haven't heard an awful lot from over the course of the last year. But according to newspaper reports, he's travelled about 200,000 miles going all over the world discussing what trade deals the United Kingdom can do once it's finally free of the European Union. So he's kind of kept his head a little bit below the parapet. He's been out there building contacts. But he said, and this is his his sort of New Year's message, I guess, really, he said that it's time uh, that perhaps we stopped this obsession with criticising Brexit. He said it's not a time bomb to be diffused. So really what Trump, what Fox is saying is there is way too much negativity, that people are somehow obsessed with Brexit, can't accept the referendum result, and at the start of this year, isn't it time we accepted? The referendum was a decision, a fork in the road. We chose the direction we're going in. Whether we like it or not, let's make the best job of it. That is what Liam Fox is saying. The question is, is he justified in saying that? Well, I really rather think he is. And to help me uh, through this thought process, let's listen to the former Deputy Prime Minister of our great nation, Lord Heseltine, speaking back in October. The best deal of all is to abandon Brexit. And I think increasingly the public will come round to that view. Well, that wasn't too positive, was it? So is he obsessed? Well, I'll tell you what, um, here he is this week speaking. It is the most depressing thing that's happened in peacetime in my lifetime. I mean, this country is a country with a huge historic claim to influence what's going on in the world. And here we are voluntarily opting out of one of the power groupings of this century. Oh dear, 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 it's getting worse. It didn't get any better, isn't it? Clearly, Christmas has not cheered up Lord Heseltine. Well, I tell you what, let's try, shall we, the president of the CBI, Paul Dreschler, speaking to Sky News in December. By the end of March, over 60% of companies that have actually got international interests, with, which, which will be impacted by this uh, uncertainty, will have to put in place contingency plans. They will not be in favour of UK jobs, investment and the next generation. So negativity there from big business and perhaps top of the pops is Lord Adonis speaking to LBC last Saturday morning. What the government chose to do, which was a straightforward policy choice on their part, was to follow Nigel Farage oh dear. and propose that we leave all European Gosh. economic institutions. <laughs> that, I believe, is what's going to do such damage to the country. Well, Gosh, if the Prime Minister and the government are following me, things really must be bad, mustn't they? Um, Well, all I can say to Lord Adonis, uh, to Paul Dreschler from the CBI, who I think have got everything wrong in terms of their economic forecasts in my lifetime, from telling us that we should join the exchange rate mechanism, which we did, disaster, that we should join the euro, which we didn't, disaster avoided, and of course to Lord Heseltine, who I sat with in this very studio 48 hours before the Brexit vote and we were interviewed by Ian Dale, and it was almost like somebody really refereeing a boxing match. We physically had to be kept apart. All I can say is that there is an absolute endless diet of negativity uh, by people who have always, always got their predictions about our European relationship wrong in every single regard, and who simply cannot accept a democratic result. And even if they haven't changed their minds, surely once you've taken that fork in the road, doesn't it make sense to try, can come together and make the best of it? So I think that Liam Fox is right. There is an obsession with criticising Brexit. Goodness me, we see it and hear it on the media every single day. And I'm asking you, if you were critical of Brexit last year, Is it now time to accept the result and to move on? And if you think it is, then please call me on 0345 6060973. Or maybe you think, actually, no, 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 no. It doesn't matter what the people thought. It doesn't matter 
uh, that manufacturing is the best it's been for 30 years. None of that matters. Actually, we should reverse Brexit. Then, of course, you can tweet to 84850. Or perhaps you've got a message you'd like to give to Liam Fox himself, in which case tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. Watch me on Facebook. We're live here from London. Without further ado, let's go to Jason in Sutton. Good evening, Jason. Good evening, Nigel. Um, I tell you what, to use the terminology of Boris Johnson, uh, Liam Fox can go whistle. 40 years we've had to put up with people like yourself telling a pack of lies about our Europe, about the European oh, Union. Oh, gosh, I, start, I must have else. started very early, mustn't I? Goodness me. Jeez, 20 years, you've been a career politician for 20 oh, years. No. Two decades, Nigel, come on. Two yeah. decades of fighting against the establishment, Jason, and finally, on that day, on the 23rd of June, <laughs> I, 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 I helped support a vote that Jason would put me out of a job. I was the turkey that voted for yeah. Christmas. I, I tell you what, Nigel, if, if anybody thinks that us Remainers are going to stop telling the truth after just two years, you've got another thing coming, I tell you. Look at the state What is the, the truth, Jason? I mean, I mean, a very, it's interesting that you use that word, because I was told the truth was we had to join the exchange rate mechanism. And, I was I mean, at, no. and at the time, Jason, I was a paid-up member of the Conservative Party. I was disgusted but the fact that we did it, I thought it would lead to economic ruin, and it did. And that, then, was the truth, as the establishment saw it. Equally, Jason, equally, Jason, all those same people I've just talked about, they all thought we should join the Euro. They all told us it would be a disaster if we didn't. didn't. They were wrong about that. I mean, you know, this word, the truth, is, is it's a difficult one, isn't it? Well, if you're talking about future predictions, then, yeah, I would agree. Um, right. Let's look at exactly what's happened in the last 18 months, two years. The state of the United Kingdom economy at the end of 2015 was just over $3 trillion. That's $3,002 billion was the, the size of the UK economy. Today, just two and a half years, two years later, and the Brexit referendum, we've lost $500 billion out of the size of our economy. If you look at our sorry, are you so, 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 sorry, Jason? Are you saying are you saying that the UK economy has contracted by about twenty percent in the last two years? If you if you value it on international monetary standards, yeah. Take our exports, for example. We just had. Oh, I'm sorry, Jason. Year. I'm really sorry. Exports. I'm really sorry. No, I would I would agree with you that growth is pathetic. It is anemic that productivity particularly is deeply concerning, our total reliance on cheap foreign labour and not investing in new technology. I would agree with you and be critical about UK growth, but we haven't contracted. The size of our economy, look, look, you can use Google, I'm sure you can. You can see the size of the, the most recent figures for the UK economy is just over two and a half trillion dollars in US dollars. This year, we've just had a record year for exports. Yep. If you read any of the figures, if you measure it in British pounds, yes, but the British pound on the international marketplace has been devalued by nearly well, 20%. Well, 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 Jason, we had a big, and you're quite right about sterling, sterling began falling in 2010, and it fell very sharply from 2010. It fell far more from 2010 to the referendum than it has since the no. referendum. Don't talk a load of old tosh. Any idiot can use the internet right. and look at the... Well, I tell you what we we'll do, Jason. Years. I tell you what, I'm not going to argue with you. What I am going to do is get a sterling dollar chart and I'm going to get it up on lbc.co.uk before this programme closes at 8 o'clock and you can look at the numbers too, all right? Sterling has fallen since the referendum, you're right, but we've bounced considerably off those slightly hysterical lows after the referendum. But, Jason, you know, whatever the... I tell you what, whatever the past is, is, would you accept that we had a vote, we've made a decision, and surely the best thing to do is to accept it and get on with it? Well, <laughs> it was based on a pack of lies, Nigel, and you know that better than any. I've been lied to all my life, and even before I... You know, my parents were told, just vote yes, don't worry your silly little heads, it's just a trade deal, it won't be political. That was a lie, wasn't it? We've, we've known that we've been looking at a United States of Europe since Winston Churchill first talked about it in 1946. Well, it would have been nice then. It would have been nice then if Mrs. Thatcher, uh, uh, who was very pro the common market in 75, and Harold Wilson and Jeremy Thorpe and the others had told the truth. Jason, I'm going to leave it there. We're never going to agree, but I am going to put that sterling chart up 
on the LBC website, lbc.co.uk. And listeners, you work out whether I'm right or whether Jason is right. Let's get on with Brexit, says Rachel in Sittingbourne. Rachel, that actually is the view of up to 70% of the electorate. Whether they voted for or against, the view of the overwhelming majority of ordinary people is simply get on with it. We're going to the East Coast, to Lowestoft, to speak to Joe. Good evening, Joe. Good evening, Nigel. No, I can hear the wind blowing. That's obviously... I'll, st- I'll jump out of the wind. I'm out of the wind st- now. Storm Ellen is still here. blowing in Lowestoft. <laughs> Good yeah. evening. Evening. Um, yes, yeah, so would you agree with me that a referendum should be on it? Well, well, I tell you what, Joe, we're told now uh, by some of the Ramonas that it was only an advisory referendum. Uh, and in strict constitutional terms, that is absolutely true. But we were absolutely promised by everybody, not just the Prime Minister and the document he said, but even Hilary Benn. You know, we were told, this is your choice, you make this decision and we will honour it. I think we're at cross purposes, Nigel. I'm on about the Good Friday Agreement. Right. Should that, should that be honoured? Because I can't see how the Good Friday Agreement can be honoured and still staying out of the customs union and the single market. And, well, I, and, and I've, I've, been, I've been given no explanation of how they wish to proceed other than um, we're going to be aligned. And there's going to be an open border. Well, I think Bertie Ahern, yeah, Joe, I think Bertie Ahern, the, the retired senior Irish politician, actually got this right when he talked about change circumstances and actually having a bit of give and take on both sides and simply making it work. Of course, you know, a quarter of a century on, circumstances, or 20 years on, circumstances can change, Joe, can't they? Oh, I, I, no doubt, but... I mean, we've, we've had in September, we've had uh, John, John Claude Juncker, after Brexit, he wants every country to join the Schengen area. So what are we going to do with the open border? Do you remember that post you had, Nigel? Well, they the do. Actually, Joe, they, not only do they want Ireland to join the Schengen area, they're also very keen to get rid of Ireland's com- competitive corporate tax base. So Ireland is facing a number of challenges, not just from Brexit, but actually coming from the European Commission themselves. Yes, but you, well, but if they do join the Schengen area, do you remember that post you had in the referendum, Nigel? I do. Yeah, that, you'll, your prediction will be right, but not because of Europe, but because of Brexit. Well, in which case, in which case, we'll have to do something about it. Joe, I thank you. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 7.15. The International Trade Secretary, Liam Fox, says there is an obsession with being negative about Brexit, and it's time at the start of this year we shook ourselves out of it and moved on, and we've listened to Lord Adonis, and we've listened to Lord Heseltine. But there are some people out there being Positive. One of them is John Longworth, a man who resigned his position with the British Chambers of Commerce to campaign for Brexit. And John's got lots of good news. He says, you know, our manufacturing order books are at a 30-year high. Um, Our export order books are at a 20-year high. Forbes magazine reported that the UK is the best place to do business in the world. But Longworth does also say that this negativity is not helping the renegotiation, because he makes the point that those that say we have to have a tariff-free deal with the European Union, whatever the cost, are effectively weakening Britain's negotiating position. Because if Mr Barnier, if Mr Barnier believes that the British government will go along with these big trade associations and that her threat to walk away unless we get a good deal is not actually a credible threat, then we're not going to get the best out of it. And I was also thought it was very interesting today in the Times that Daniel Finkelstein said the idea that Brexit can be stopped is a dangerous delusion that ignores the continuing revolt against political elites. And Finkelstein is absolutely bang on the money. There are elections coming up this year in Italy and elsewhere that will see a growth of Euroscepticism. And fascinatingly, they're not for tonight, 
in Italy and the other countries, the people that want to leave the euro and leave the European Union are all the under forces. It's the big difference between Euroscepticism in Britain and indeed what's happening in the rest of Europe. So should we simply accept the result and get on with it? And certainly if last year, you know, you were very, very worried and very negative about Brexit, have you now changed your mind? Is it time to move on? Theo Phyllis on Facebook says, common sense dictates that in democracies, referendum results should be respected regardless of the outcome. I've got a first-time caller from Portsmouth in the shape of Paul. Good evening, Paul. No, good evening, Nigel. Um, <laughs> I voted to stay in the yes. European Union uh, on the referendum. Uh-huh. And I'm not your biggest fan. Let me put this, I am not your biggest fan. Well, that's, so it's, it's that's all right, Paul. As, 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 as long as we can argue without coming to blows, then it'll be OK, well, won't gonna, it? Oh, no, we're, we're actually, we're not going to argue. Because... Oh. Since since the referendum, and, and I'm one of those that that, that, that has accepted the, the result. Yes. Said, okay, let's get on with it. And and over, over the last uh, couple of years, I've been so appalled at Barnier and Tusk and Juncker, etc., bullying uh, this country. And also, you've got Hesseltine, Lord Hesseltine, and mm. Adonis. Mm. So Vincent Cable and now Sir, Sir Nicholas Clegg. I know. Going on and on about how we should stop it and everything else. The answer is no. Um, I've got to the stage where I am a committed, and uh, I said to your, I said to your uh, young lady on the on the phone earlier on, I don't like the word Brexiteer, but I am going to say I'm a committed Brexiteer. I want us I, out. Gosh, now, so you, I, Paul, you've been through this Damascene conversion. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually a bit reluctant because I've, I've always been sort of a, a Eurosceptic in one way, but for, okay, it's better than the devil, you know, the devil you don't after 40 years. Mm. But uh, I've got so fed up with all this nonsense that's come out from all these people. They don't want to um, um, respect the wishes of the, the people, the British people. I do. I mean, why would I, why would I, as a Democrat and a voter, and I'm a Conservative voter, yep. if, somebody, if you have a Labour government, what am I going to do? March up and down the street saying, we don't want a Labour government? No, Paul, you, no, Paul, you will accept the result, saying, you will accept the result, and, and yeah. hope that your side wins next time round. It's, it's called democracy, isn't it? Yeah, I don't want to see another referendum, that's for sure. I don't want it. I And I support, now you may agree with, disagree with me, hmm. I support Theresa's, Theresa May's, what she's doing, what she's attempting to do. Now, I don't want us to walk away. I want us to negotiate. And I, but I do want a fair, level playing field from the O's other bunch of uh, undemocratic, non-elected oh, commissioners. Oh, Paul, you hard-line extremist. You sound like me. Um, do you know what, Paul? <laughs> uh, do you know what, Paul? I think you're right. I think the attitude that has been shown to us by Juncker, Barnier and the rest of them has been high-handed at best, perhaps even, one might say, arrogant. And I also think, Paul, that since that referendum... We've seen, uh, you know, we've seen the State of the Union speech from Juncker, where he says we will have a European army by 2025. Everyone must join Schengen. Everyone must join the Euro. And I think a lot of voters have looked at that and thought, cool, thank goodness we voted the way that we did. Paul, I thank you very much indeed. Excellent phone call. And if you believe the YouGov polls, actually, Paul uh, is one of many, many people out there. They voted for us to remain. They voted for, to quote Paul, better the devil you know. But they now think, actually, we really ought to get on with this. And talking, talking of Michel Barnier, you might remember back in October, I read out a letter on this show that I'd written to him because I'd seen a never-ending stream of Ramona's, you know, Ken Clark and Lord Adonis and Nick Clegg all going to meet him in Brussels, in his office, and I wrote that letter saying, I'd like a meeting too, because I don't think you're hearing from anyone actually representing the 17.4 million that voted for us to leave. Um, and I'll tell you, later on in this show, I've, I've now finally, finally come to a situation where I will be meeting Mr Barnier. Steve is calling from Hackney. He's another first-time caller. Good evening, Steve. 
Hello, hi, good evening, Nigel. I was one of uh, your fans, which I was 100% agreed with you in the past, but now I'm extremely, extremely angry and upset. Yeah. Based on, you know, the lies, I'm so sorry to use this word, on Brexit, every single word that you guys said is lie. I personally, I don't know about the country. Well, I'll tell you what, Steve. I'll tell you what, Steve. Before you go through, Steve, Steve, I always do this. I always do this. Whenever anybody comes on and, and, and accuses me of lying in the referendum campaign, I always ask the same question. Name one lie that I told in the referendum campaign, Steve. I clearly tell you. I, I said to you, I just I think about my own business. I'm a small business owner. And I had 10 members of staff. Now we have seven. The demand has gone by 50% less. The cost of the goods that we import is gone by 40%. If you don't believe me, I put all the invoices in front of you. My tax returns, VAT, everything, I put it in front of you that it clearly shows that I pay 40% more and employ less people. And I voted for, uh, for big debt simply because to save the NHS, and you can see what's going on in it. Well, Steve, NHS. Steve, Steve, as somebody who ran his own small business through good times and some pretty rough times too, uh, you know, you've got my sympathy if you're going through a very difficult time. Um, but I, you know, if I look at unemployment overall in this country, it's the lowest it's been for decades. Uh, and, and whilst growth is not fantastic, I would certainly accept that. Uh, but can you, can I please ask my question to you again? What lie did I tell you in the referendum? I just clearly told you that you can create more jobs, which we are losing our job. Oh. Uh, in this, you know, because of the cost of Brexit, we lost like a lot of uh, uh, European customers. We solely depends on those customers. They're all gone, and we are paying. Well, Steve, 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 Steve. If you if you take the British economy, only ten percent of the British economy, maybe 12% on a good day, but let's say 10% of the British economy is involved with exports to the European Union. Um, 80% of our economy doesn't do any overseas business at all. It is all business that goes on within our own country. And Steve, I did argue very strongly in the referendum that to have a rule book that binds the 80% of our businesses, of, of our economy, who don't do overseas trade, actually was crackers, that we should be in charge of making our own rules and regulations. And Steve, I did say in the referendum, we may get governments that make bad law, but we will at least be able to change that law once every five years by voting for a different government with a different manifesto. And the point, Steve, about European legislation is there is nothing, nothing we the voter can do to change any of it. I really, I really want someone to stop this Brexit. If there is no referendum, at least the government should think about it thoroughly and properly before going out of Europe, regardless of if we voted 50% or 42% or 58%, whatever it is. But I just want people to understand, like you earlier said, 70% of British public agrees and happy to go ahead with Brexit. Yes. That is not true. Can you prove that? Yes, can I can give you five opinion polls. polls. I can give you five opinion polls that have been put out by YouGov. Do you know what, Steve? Because I'm really getting a little bit tired of being called a liar. Uh, what I'll do to help you is I will make sure the up-to-date YouGov polls on how people see Brexit are up on lbc.co.uk by... I'm looking here at the producer by 8 o'clock. 8.30, he says to me. Anyway, they'll be there. <laughs> You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show. It's exclusive at LBC. It's now 7.30. Well, the International Trade Secretary, Liam Fox, says there is an obsession with being negative about Brexit, and it's time at the start of this year we shook ourselves out of it. And what he's saying is, get over it, accept the result, and get on with it. And I'm asking, and I'm particularly asking people, I'm happy to take people from both sides, but I'm particularly asking people who were Remainers, you know, do they now think, actually, Fox is right, and we should simply get on with the job and respect the result? Now, you can't help noticing, uh, across uh, every form of media at the moment, there are headlines running about a pretty strong war of words that is going on between Donald Trump, the US President, and Steve Bannon, his former special advisor. Uh, I know uh, both of these men. 
Um, and it's always a great shame when people who've been allies and friends fall out. But fallout they have. And I think this fallout, in many ways, says a lot about Donald Trump. You know, whether you like Donald Trump, whether you loathe Donald Trump, uh, and it's something that was said to me first by Piers Morgan, who's known Trump for a number of years, and somebody else whose name I won't mention, but a quite prominent Scottish businessman who'd known Trump for 30 years. The thing about Trump is he is absolutely, fiercely loyal to people, and his absolute ultimate priority and loyalty is to his family. So when Steve Bannon criticised one of his sons in a comment uh, that came out um, as, as part of an extract from a book today, um, I'm not in the least bit surprised that the president has responded the way that he has. As I say, like him or loathe him, this man is fiercely loyal and he puts his family above absolutely everything. As I suspect do a majority of you listening to this programme right now. It's what people do. Returning, returning to negativity, the obsession with negativity, as Liam Fox describes it, and the need for us to shake out of it. I'm going to ask John in Formby, is Liam Fox right, John? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you've got to follow Bing Crosby, I think it was, accentuate the positive. Yes. Um, positive mental altitude, sports people will tell you. Uh, but I detect here what I would call Alan Ball syndrome. Let me tell you what that means. Alan Ball uh, syndrome? Yes, well, he, he was a vital part... This is the 1966 the... World Cup footballer, and... yeah? Yes, but uh, in the uh, mid-70s... Yeah. Uh, ..when he'd been dropped by Don Revy, mm -hmm. and England had a key match, I think it was against Italy, he, he said, I, I'll be telling you in my column why I want England to lose. Uh, obviously, so that he could come back as the national saviour. Did he really uh, do that? Oh, yeah. And I, 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 I assume he never played for England again. I think, I think that's right, yes. Uh, I, I, I think that's true. Uh, ob obviously, even after they lost the game... They John, couldn't... there may be listeners who think we're diverting a bit off the track talking about the 1966 World Cup squad. But come yeah, on, the, please. The principle, <laughs> the principle's exactly the same. If... if, if um, yes. They can talk it down and sabotage it, and there yes. is a lot of sabotage going on. Remember, uh, Rudolf Hesseltine said uh, that, that it, uh, Brexit is a boil that needs to be lanced. <laughs> then they think they can go back to the public and say, hey, let's stop it. But uh, another point to consider is uh, what if we do have a second referendum? Now, what happens then if they lose again? Is it going to be the, the, the best of 500 or...? Well, I think, John, to be honest with you, if the second referendum was about rejoining a European Union that had now made absolutely clear that everybody must join the currency, everybody must be in the Schengen zone, everybody must be part of a foreign policy without veto, which could even include acts such as going to war and be part of a European army, I think, John... I don't believe there will be a second referendum on us rejoining the European Union because I think we would reject it overwhelmingly. Yes, uh, and I think more facts will come to light. Did you hear the beauty from Lord Adonis? Well, I heard a lot from Lord Adonis, a, a qu qu quite a bit of it about me in a less than complimentary way, but go on. Well, well, well he came out with an absolute classic. Uh, he, he was uh, challenged about uh, Merkel's million, the, the mass uh, migration. Yeah. We all, we all know about the um, uh, wintertime assaults uh, on, on women, and now there's been some uh, outbreak of crime in uh, Lower Saxony, I believe. But uh, he, his attitude to this was, uh, well, well, it's a challenge. Almost so it's a bit of fun, like going like round uh, an obstacle course. Wow. He, he, he also said that the reunification of Germany um, it was a much bigger challenge, you know, I just don't get that. Mm. Well, John, I have to say one thing, that I, not long after the referendum, I'm talking perhaps three, four months afterwards, I was on a radio debate programme with, um, with a former Labour cabinet minister, um, and he said to me, he said, I think Mrs Merkel tipped the balance in favour of Brexit that people saw the huge numbers that she was encouraging into Europe, 
realised that within a few years they would all have EU passports and that was a major contributory factor to people voting Brexit. His name was David Blunkett. John, as ever, I thank you for your call. Now, Shane on Facebook says, 350 million to the NHS, written on the side of a bus, you drove around the country. Wasn't that a lie? Shane, I didn't drive it round the country. I never, ever supported the figure of 350 million. It wasn't a lie. It was the gross amount we have to write in to our annual budget. But, of course, there is an annual rebate, which Mrs Thatcher negotiated, although Blair gave away half of it. Um, And then, of course, there is money that we get back, and it comes back in the form of agricultural support, regional spending, etc. So, no, it wasn't a lie... But I didn't think the figure was a wise one to use, and I did advise Boris's camp of that at the time. Gary says the 350 million is not a lie, uh, but cannot materialise until we actually leave. So what's hard to understand about that? Well, unfortunately, Gary, uh, what the Prime Minister seems terribly pleased about is the fact that we're going after the 29th of March 2019, um, is that we're going to go into a transition period where effectively we go on paying the full membership fee for another two years, and that is part of this overall £40 billion package for us to leave. Um, I wonder, Nigel, we made our decision. The economy is not the only aspect of Brexit, and anyway, we haven't left yet, so who can judge, says Elaine. We're quite sensible, Elaine, we haven't left yet. And you're right, everybody is arguing this as if the referendum was all about future economic predictions, which probably both sides have got wrong. Brexit was not about future economic predictions. Brexit was about, do we wish to be a self-governing nation or not? Do we think we're better making our own laws in our own country, or is it better to be part of a bigger new state of the European Union? Brexit was about sovereignty, democracy, self-governance. That is what Brexit was really all about about. I wonder what Freddie in Chelmsford makes of this debate tonight. Good evening. Yes, good evening, Nigel. Thank you very much for taking the call. Um, The point I want to make is quite simple. Um, I I voted in the 1975 um, referendum. I'm that old. And when we lost, we lost the referendum fair and square. There wasn't a peep of dissent. That was it. We accepted the loss. Yes. And we said, let's move on and get on with it and the world turned, and the rest is history. Freddie, that is now, so Fre- Freddie, that is absolutely true. It's absolutely true that the Leave side did accept the result, but maybe, and just to sort of try and be objective about this, the difference was, of course, it was a bigger margin, wasn't it, last time, that, that in that referendum, 66% voted to stay, whereas in this case, it was 52% that voted to leave. So that, that perhaps is a difference. That's correct. But the big difference between that referendum and this one, if I may say so, Mm. is that the whole of Fleet Street was lined up with moving into Europe. There wasn't a single organ that said, um, no, this isn't the right way to move. And it was dear old Peter Shaw and one or two other honourable people that that championed it. But they were they were. It was a David versus Actually, Freddie, Freddie, I know the history of this and you're absolutely right. The whole of Fleet Street lined up to say, vote remain. The Mail, the Express, all of them said, vote remain. There were three publications who said, vote leave. The Morning Star, The Spectator magazine, and The Dundee Courier. How about that? So they were the only three in the whole country. I'm glad my my memory has stood the test of that. No, you're dead right. can Can I please just make one mention to Lords Hesseltine and Adonis? Please just have a bit of sense of British fair play. We lost last last time, and we accepted it. Now you've lost this time. Just be honourable and say, okay, you've won, fair and square. Please do that. Freddie, what a wonderful way to end the phone call. Thank you very much indeed. There we are, Lords Heseltine and Adonis. Be honourable, says Freddie in Chelmsford. You're listening to the Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 7.45. Is Liam Fox right? Do some of our public figures simply have an obsession with Brexit that actually now puts them even more out of touch 
with public opinion in this country. And I'm particularly asking people who voted in that referendum remain whether they now think it's time we actually moved on and simply accepted a democratic result, whether we liked it or not, and just got on with it. No, Brexit would be the worst single decision ever taken by the UK. It must be stopped at all costs, says Adam on Twitter. Well, Adam, there are people who fanatically feel like you about it, but I would suggest that that is a sh rapidly shrinking number of people. And I do think, and we've had this from a couple of callers tonight, I do think that the behaviour of Juncker and Barnier towards us, their stated ambitions to move on to a full United States of Europe, I think that actually has made quite a big difference since that referendum. That's my view. I wonder what Nick in Kings Lynn thinks. Good evening, Nick. Good evening. Well, with reference to your last caller, your humble caller, Freddie, yeah. He says he voted in 1975 in a referendum yes. to uh, to leave, yes. and he humbly accepted the result. Yes. I'll just suggest to him that he had no choice to accept the result. Oh, right. Because so British capitalism was in such total disarray in the 70s after the collapse of the post-war boom and the swinging 60s that staying in Europe was the only obvious alternative. It was crying out for EU subsidies, was crying out for EU trade. Well, you say, e Nick, why. Nick, Nick, you say EU subsidies, but actually, actually, uh, in every single year, we've been a net contributor, haven't we? Well, only because of the state, yeah, because we are a net contributor, because we are a stronger economy now than what was before. Yeah, but, but even back in the 70s, even back in the 70s, when, and you're quite right, we were going through a pretty bleak period, you know, for every single year after that referendum, despite all of our problems and going to the IMF, we were still contributors, weren't we? Well, we were contributors, yes, because of the nature of our, our economy. And things like, you can't just look at it in black and white and compare us to other nations like uh, Germany or, or le lesser, lesser countries like former Eastern Bloc countries are now, like Romania and uh, mm. uh, Czechoslovakia or the Czech Republic and things like that. You can't just make that black and white analogy. Well, Nick, circumstance, circumstances I accept are different, but Freddie made a point that nobody complained after 75 and he was right. But, but, but people are certainly complaining now, Nick, aren't they? Oh, well, let's go back, let's go back to this point that you raised a couple of times about the advisory nature of this referendum. It was advisory, as well you know, Nigel. So, no, Nick, I've said... Non, Nick, it was non-binding. Nick, I've said already on this show, I've, I've conceded on this show that, that in terms of our constitution in this country, that it was advisory and non-binding. But, Nick, but, Nick, we were told by the Prime Minister, we were even told by Hillary Benn in Parliament, everyone told us that actually whatever we decided would be honoured. And do you know why that was? Do you know why they played it all down about the non-advisory nature? Because they knew with so many people who were convinced, who were brainwashed to think that Europe was the cause of our economic problems, they didn't want to upset them if there was a leave vote. That's what it was all about. That's why there was no mention about it being so, advisory. So they just lied to us, Nick, yeah? Well, it was not so much a lie. You know, well, it sounds like it. It sounds like a whopping great big it lie. Was a clever, it was a clever piece of political manipulation. And you talk about Ramonas, Ramonas. You can only call Michael Eseltine as being a lefty Ramona. Andrew Adonis, a lefty. The CBI. The no, Nick, nobody, CFI, nobody, the Nick, the nobody, Nick, on this show tonight has used the word lefty. Well, nobody. You only have to look nobody. At, uh, may not on this show. No, nobody. Not me. Not anybody. Used, it is constantly used. Well, let me lift it, liberal or whatever. It's that we're all supposed. All these remainers or rem are supposed to be on the left, which is rather stupid, really, because the EU is not a left-wing organisation. It's not a communist organisation, and I've seen that written on several on your own Facebook web. Facebook site and a lot of, a lot of Brexit websites. Website. Oh, I, I, it's I, all I, communist. No, it's a right wing form of communism. Absolutely, I mean, I wouldn't disagree with that. I wouldn't disagree with that. But uh, and, and it is. I, I, I've said communist, Nick, because it is big government, and you can't sack the people that make the rules. And voters in elections can't do anything to change legislation. Nick, do you want a second referendum? Uh, no, I didn't want any referendum in the first place. I just want Brexit to collapse on its own accord, which I think it will, Nigel. 
Okay, Nick, fine. Your view is clear. I don't agree with it, but hey, you've said it loudly and clearly. Um, Matthew is calling from Heathrow. Good evening, Matthew. Hi, Nigel. Good evening. Uh, basically, I mean, I'm a Remainer, except that we're going to leave. But basically, because it's the Northern Ireland border issue, I think it's time for you to accept that, I mean, we're only going to leave in name only um, until we resolve that, the border, the border issue there. And we've just got to, everyone's got to unite working together to solve that problem. And everyone's got to unite behind Theresa May so she doesn't have to rely on the DUP. Well, so Matthew, we, I, 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 you know, I, I agree with certainly the first part of what you said, that the course the Prime Minister has currently got us on, are we going to leave the European Union? Yes. But will we effectively have left in name only because we're wrapped up in transition deals? We haven't even attempted to deal with getting back our territorial fishing waters, etc. That's probably true. As far as the, as far as the border in Ireland is concerned, you know, people say one half in the customs union, um, one part of Northern Ireland outside the customs union, the larger part in the customs union means there have to be all sorts of border checks. You know, Matthew, already we have different taxes on both sides of the borders. We have a different currency on both sides of the borders. And I think Bertie Ahern, you know, was really, former shock, really showed a grown-up attitude that will just deal with it. And, I, I, and, and, and that's, that's what I think. But Matthew, I want to ask you, as a Remainer that, that has accepted the result, how do you view the comments and the behaviour of Lord Adonis and Lord Heseltine? Well, I mean, I think yeah, the, the people still asking for this second referendum are basically, I would call them Ramonas as well, but basically, you know, I think everyone has got to unite together, you know, to try to sort out the Northern Ireland issue. If we, but I mean, we are going to leave, but basically we're going to have restrictions on what trade we could do to, with the rest of the world because we need to keep the frictionless border what we're going to end up having to still pay something towards the eu for but um, that, i mean even ireland i mean that they they need to transit their goods through the uk i know which is why which is why matthew actually what we should do is we should go above the european union straight to the world trade organization and say will you support us in putting together putting together a tariff-free deal between Ireland and the United Kingdom for politically sensitive reasons, so that not only can our trade be tariff-free, but they can transship their goods through us as well. Matthew, I do understand the complexity of this, uh, but I do actually think that the current Irish Prime Minister, the current Irish Taoiseach, is not really acting in the interests of the Irish people. He's acting in the interests of Brussels. Matthew, I thank you very much indeed for your call. I'm going to take one last quick call. Steve, a first-time caller from Congleton. Good evening. Good evening, Nigel. Yeah, uh, the original point of your phone-in was to say, should people who want to remain yeah. be reconciliatory now and be proactive? Yes. Um, and I, I think you're probably the worst proponent of that, because you're, you're very the way you attack people when they come on and disagree with you, the way you yelled and bawled in the European Parliament, you're setting the tone. Oh, Steve, I don't attack conflict. people. I don't attack people you that do. come on unless, unless, of course, unless, of course, Steve, they call me a liar or something stupid like that. Otherwise, no. You know, Steve, if you've got a different point of view, I want to hear it. I just told you, you're probably the worst proponent of reconciliation in this whole debate. It's kind of funny coming from you that we should all sit down and agree with you and be positive, and yet you you really don't um, give that impression at all that you would do the same. And you didn't, in fact, when you were in the European Court, European Parliament. Well, I had to really, fight, really Steve. Vehemently against it. I had to fight. I had to fight against the entire establishment in this country who all had the same view and wrote off anyone that took a different view as being mad, bad and dangerous. So, yes, Steve, I accept the point. I've had to punch pretty hard uh, to raise the profile of this issue. But I promise you, Steve, I respect people who've got different points of view. And if you listen, if you listen to my interview with Vince Cable, sorry, sorry, Sir Vince Cable uh, the other week, if you listen to that, uh, I think, I hope, Steve, from Congleton, you'll go to lbc.co.uk, uh, have a look at that interview, uh, and, and, and I hope I treated him with absolute respect. Listen, I thank all of you for your calls, and yeah, we've had several of you tonight on the phone, Remainers, who are saying, Do you know what, let's accept the result and get on with it, and maybe Liam Fox is right.
in pointing out this obsessive negativity that we're getting from Heseltine, Adonis and others. So back in October, I wrote to Mr Barnier asking for a meeting after a stream of Ramonas had been into his office in Brussels. I got a letter back saying he'd meet me in the members' bar in Strasbourg. Uh, I thought I perhaps could do with a bit better than that. I do want to represent the views of 17.4 million people. I will be meeting formally with Mr Barnier in Brussels next week. I'll tell you exactly when it is tomorrow. You've been listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. I'm back tomorrow at 7 when I'll tell you that news. Coming up at 10 tonight, it's Nick Abbott, Infrey and Collins. But up next, it's Clive Bull. Nigel, thank you.